Uh, good afternoon. It is a balmy Thursday afternoon here on the in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and wherever you're joining us from, whether this is you viewing a recording on our YouTube channel, another time zone, your office, your home, wherever that is, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Spencer Giese. I'm a research education specialist at a KUI. Uh, and one of the many joys in my career, I get to work a lot with our virtual programming. Uh, today we've got another uh, installment of our webinar series, Creating Close Communities While at Distance. Uh, before we dive into our topic and meet our speakers, just want to do a couple tech checks um, on your Zoom system. So a couple things I'd point out to you. Uh, you have a Q&A button on your Zoom menu. That is your ability throughout today's session to submit a question, um, and then our speakers can take a look at that announce that to the group and answer that for you on the Q&A tab as well as if you see a question you really want to make sure you get gets answered you can hit the thumbs up the like function on that that will upvote it and allow our speakers to see that's a hot topic that we'd like to discuss today uh, we also have a chat function where you can connect with our speakers through the chat and you can also connect with the other attendees as well um, and just to make sure that you're seeing um, webcams you're seeing a PowerPoint deck uh, and you're hearing our voice, if you could just hit the raised hand function on your Zoom menu. We will use that a bit later, so it's helpful to see that that is working. Great. Sounds like we're loud and clear. Uh, we've got over 60 folks with us today joining us live, so thank you again so much for taking that time out uh, to join us. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Katie and Danielle to in introduce themselves and today's topic. So, Katie. Awesome. Thanks so much, Spencer. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Uh, thank you for being here. We are excited to bring you session two of a three-part series, and we are talking about the basic model, which represents building a strong, involving community, and how we can build close communities in this time when we're going to have to keep our students at a distance from one another. So I have one of the co-authors of BASIC here with me today, uh, Danielle. So I'm gonna allow her to introduce herself quickly before we jump into today's session. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everybody. So jazzed to see so many people here. Um, really quick about myself. Um, I've been in higher ed for about 12 years now. Um, got my master's in college student development and counseling from Northeastern. Um, worked in a few colleges around the Boston area until um, about just about two and a half years, three years ago now, I relocated to Los Angeles, where now I work at Pepperdine University in Malibu. Um, you're in for a treat today. My colleague Katie is amazing. Um, so um, I will be here. Um, please chat me if you have any questions, but otherwise, I'll kick it back over to Katie. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dee. All right, well, like I said, we are here for session two of a three-part series. However, if you're thinking to yourself, oh shoot, I wasn't here for part one, I'm gonna to be totally lost, have no fear. Uh, we are gonna quickly, I'm gonna quickly catch you up to speed. Uh, and the great thing about this three-part series is that you don't have to have attended any single session in order for the next one to make sense. So um, before I jump into our content for today, um, I just wanted to go ahead and introduce myself. So obviously my name is Katie. And I worked in higher ed for about 10 years, worked in university housing all 10 of those years. Um, but my journey in residence life university housing actually started as a first year freshman student. Uh, I was a front desk assistant as a first year student at Bellarmine University. And then I went on to be an RA and kind of worked my way through residence hall staff positions. Um, until about four years ago, I was working as, a, as an assistant director and university housing at Florida State University. Um, and then I left the field, but lucky for me, I am one of the co-authors of the basic model. So I have the opportunity to stay involved in the residence life uh, world and to be involved in what's going on. And so um, as we kind of were sitting back watching what's happening in the world around us as it relates to COVID-19, the three of us, which you should also probably now be seeing Claudia's face as well, uh, the three of us, were talking with one another and said, you know, what can we be doing to provide support or to kind of come into the conversation around what life on campus is going to look like in the fall as it relates to basic. And so when we were having that conversation, we really decided that, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about is community development and how do we work with residence hall staff to build community among residents uh, and to build involved community with residents. 
And so we decided, well, why don't we create a webinar series that would go into more detail about, well, how do you build community when you can't do it in the tried and true ways that we've been doing it for decades now um, of gathering groups of people together for programs and communities and large campus events? Um, what does community look like when you're not able to do any of those kind of ways that we've been doing it in the past? And so that's what we're bringing you today. If you were here last week, you will know that we actually talked about Jeep as a company, and we talked about some of the ways, uh, some of the practices, some of the parts of their culture that they have put into place that have built community among Jeep owners that never require them to leave their Jeep. And so we talked about some of the different features that uh, owners can put on the Jeep itself, Easter eggs or what those are referred to. We talked about the Jeep wave um, among Jeep drivers. And so we talked about a number of ways that community can be built without anyone ever having to leave their Jeep. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about a different company and a way that they go about building community. But before we do that, I actually want to talk to you a little bit about the basic model itself, because when you registered, you actually let us know how many of you had never heard of basic at all, how many of you had heard of it but had never used it, and how many of you have heard it but actually have heard of it and actually use it. And a significant number of you had never heard of BASIC whatsoever. And so I want to make sure that we give due diligence to making sure you actually know what BASIC is before we start talking about it. So BASIC is really a leadership development model for residence hall staff on college campuses, particularly or specifically written toward the RA position with an accompanying booklet for supervisors to help facilitate the supervision of the RA's experience in the BASIC model. So there are three major components that I want to talk to you about today. The first is what we refer to as the six-step community development model, because we know that the way a person becomes a leader, you know, basic is all about developing leaders. A way that people become a leader is one, certainly, you know, some people might consider someone a leader based on their title. So simply by being called a resident assistant, it might be assumed that they are the leader of the community. But to us, really where leadership comes in is the person who is owning the experience of the community, the one who is really keeping an eye on how are my members of this community being connected to one another and how are they connected to me and vice versa. And that's really what the six step model is all about, is giving them a method through which they can build that community, begin to get to know their residents and connect their residents with one another. So I'll quickly, quickly walk you through these six steps, very intuitive in nature. Uh, first is just learning names and the importance of knowing residents' names. Dale Carnegie says the sweetest, name, the sweetest sound a person will ever hear is the sound of their own name. And so we really emphasize the importance of knowing each other's names. Next is once you know a resident's name, it's important to begin stacking information about them, stacking conversations, which is essentially to say when you're interacting with a resident, when you are um, kind of seeing them in the hallway, even beginning that first day when they begin to move in on move-in day, what information can you begin to stack about that person? What are you learning about who they are, where they're from, what they're interested in, what it is that they're good at? Just information that you're logging about them in the conversations that you're having. And the reason why it's important to do that is because the third step is mapping assets and identifying DEAs, which is essentially to say what assets does that person bring to this community based on the information I'm gathering about them? And also what experiences do they desire? What do I need to learn about what it is that they're looking for out of this college experience? So I'm kind of mapping, kind of looking out for those assets and those DEAs. Once I'm doing that, then I'm beginning to identify, are there any matches in my community? Is there a resident who has an asset that could fill an experience that another student is interested in having. So I'm mapping those out to see, can I make, are there any matches between the members of my community? Because the fifth step is then to actually take the action to tap that asset, to go to that first resident and say, hey, did you know that the student down the hall actually is really interested in learning to play the guitar and you've been playing it since you were five years old? Do you think the two of you could connect over that? So tapping those assets, connecting them with one another, and then the sixth step is all about filling gaps, which is essentially to say that there are going to be desired experiences among your community members for which you're not going to be able to fill based on who's present in your community. There are going to be experiences that are desired 
that no one in your community is able to help fill. And so that's when we look to the greater, whether it's the greater community of the building itself, whether it's the greater community of your campus, or even if it's the community of the city in which your campus is located to say, what other resources are available to help fill these gaps to fill the experiences that students are interested in having. And so again, this is a very fluid, intuitive process that your staff members would kind of work through all year long. They are constantly, well, hopefully not constantly learning names, hopefully they get that from the beginning. But other than that, they are always stacking information about residents. And even in this virtual, you know, somewhat virtual world that we might be living in, you know, your students might be hosting programs via Zoom like we're hosting this today, there's still opportunity to be stacking information about their residents. What are they seeing in the background of the screen? What are they noticing about what their residents are wearing? What mood are they noticing about their residents? So there's still an ability to be stacking those conversations, stacking that information, whether it's happening face-to-face -face or if it's happening virtually. The second component of BASIC that I wanna to talk to you about are the challenge cards. So the way that we actually explicitly go about teaching the leadership skills involved in the BASIC model is through these challenge cards. So we have identified 46 leadership traits or attributes that based on the business world, based on the latest research out there about employability, have been identified as being important leadership traits in kind of the future workforce of the world, if you will. And so what we have done is taken 46 of those attributes and created a deck of cards around them. So each card represents one leadership attribute and on it is a real world example of that leadership attribute in action. And then at the bottom, there is a leadership challenge for the student staff to complete that week. This is the way that we actually go about teaching those leadership traits. They get their real hands-on experience with how to go about building those leadership skills. Some of those challenges are gonna be self-reflections that they do. Some of them are going to involve doing something with a couple of residents. Some of them are gonna involve pairing up with another RA staff member to complete the challenge. So they vary in nature. Um, and we're actually gonna get into more detail about six of the challenge cards towards the end of today's session when we talk about how these challenge cards can actually be used to build community among residents. And we're gonna give, or I'm gonna share examples of how they can do that in a socially or physically distant way. The third component that I wanna to talk to you about uh, is what we call the supervisor touch point. So your RA staffs are gonna be facilitating the six step model. They're going to be completing these challenge cards. So what is the role of the supervisor? And so we have identified six different touch points that probably every supervisor is going to have with their student staff members. And so these are the moments or these are the ways that the supervisor is gonna go about actually implementing, facilitating and coaching their staff members through the basic model. So there is a supervisor's guide that walks the supervisor through all the different components of the model, as well as how to use these different touch points as a way to help do that. So how can you be talking about those leadership challenge cards in your one-on-one? -on what questions can you be asking in a weekly report related to whether or not they're building that involved community based off of the six step model? So that is the basic model itself. But really what we wanna spend the bulk of today talking about is that sounds great, but how do I build community when I can't do it in the way I've been doing it for my entire career or the way my department has been doing it since the beginning of residence hall time? How does this actually happen? And so we're gonna dig in on a case study of an outdoor fitness program called Camp Gladiator is what we're gonna dig in on today. But before we do that, there are some core assumptions that we are making or that we hold as it relates to community, the leadership role in community development. So I wanna quickly walk you through those just so we're kind of sitting on an even playing field. We're kind of speaking the same language before we head into the case study. The first one is B equals F function of P times E, which is essentially to say, what is the behavior that we are seeking out of our residents. And I would say the behavior we're talking about today is how do I build community? How do communities get built? I want a strong, I want an involving community in my residence hall. And so if that's the behavior that we are seeking, then in order to get that, that is going to be a function of the people that are a part of that community 
times the environment that we create for them, which is really what we're here to talk about today is how do we create an environment in which that behavior can be built? What influence, what impact can we have on how we intentionally create the environment in which community can be built? The second is a community connection model, which is to say, okay, if we wanna build community, I think one of the functions that we all would say are important or is important in community is that students feel connected to one another. They feel connected to their RA, they feel connected to their roommate, they feel connected to the larger community as a whole. And so how does that happen? And so what this model is looking at is the impact of time. So experiences that are short in nature or experiences that are longer in nature, but also intensity, which is to say, how much is it requiring of the student themselves? And what we're talking about here is physical and psychological energy. So how much thought or how much physical energy are they having to put into this experience? And what this research project showed is that the greatest connection to community comes when students are having experiences in all four of these quadrants. So when they're having short experiences that are low in intensity, short experiences that are higher in intensity, as well as long experiences that are low in intensity and long time experiences that are high in intensity. And so today we're gonna to talk about how you can be creating experiences for your students in all four of these quadrants. So without any further ado, let's get into the case study. So I mentioned that today we're gonna to talk about Camp, Glad Camp Gladiator, which is an outdoor uh, community group fitness program. And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, what do you mean from a distance? Like you just said, they're outdoor and those people look like they're all together. Um, and so what I really want to focus on is one, kind of what, um, what methodology the Camp Gladiator used to create such a strong sense of community. But then when COVID happened four months ago, how did they take that model that they had created and adapt it to the virtual world from a distance? that allowed that strong sense of community to continue, both for people that had previously been a part of Camp Gladiator, but also those that maybe were joining for the first time. So how did their tried and true practices of community, similar to tried and true practices we have in residence life, get translated into the virtual world when people could no longer be together? So quick background on Camp Gladiator. It's been around for 10 years. Uh, it was started here in Texas, which is actually where I am currently located, currently living. Um, but is in, I think, five or six different states now around the country. It's an outdoor fitness program. And really what it's all about is bringing together community and fitness. Their kind of tried and true method of community is all about a hardcore workout with friendship. And so they are as much invested in making sure that people know one another, are being a support to one another, are holding one another accountable, as much as they are into the actual workout itself. When you drive around the local area that I live in, it is hard to take a drive down the street without noticing someone's car that has a decal with the CG logo on it. Reason being, again, that it's about, they are invested as in much as you connecting with one another as they are about the actual workout that you're receiving. And so back in March, when kind of the stay at home order came into place and literally no one could be around each other anymore unless you were in the same household, they very quickly had to transition into an online format. And so they began offering live workouts with their trained certified trainers through Zoom. And so today what we're gonna talk about is how did they continue to create community through a virtual format in which no one was able to be in the same physical space. And the way we're gonna do that is I'm actually gonna analyze it from two different community development theories, if you will. The first one, is Macmillan and Chavez's sense of community model. And what they identified is that there are four, if you will, non-negotiables as it relates to creating a sense of community for people. The first is that they need to feel a sense of membership. The second is that they need to feel as though they have influence. And so influence not only in that they influence the community, but that also the community is going to influence them. Third, is that they need to feel as though the community can fulfill their needs. And what it, they are talking about here is fulfilling needs in terms of what competency is it that I want to learn that I feel like this community can fill for me? How is it that this community can invest in me and how can I invest in it? And also, how is it that I can go about feeling successful or that I can feel rewarded through what it is that I'm doing? 
And then the fourth aspect that they talk about are shared emotional connections, which is to say, how can I feel as though my connections with people are quality connections? They're not just surface level. I'm really kind of getting to a deeper level. But also, how is it that I can quickly feel as though I am being invested in? So similar to that fulfillment of needs, how is it that I'm feeling that emotional connection because I feel like people are giving back to me? So I want to go back through the four, and I want to give you examples from Camp Gladiator to talk about how were they able to do each of these things. So under membership, this is really talking about making sure that community members feel a sense of belonging. And they talk about three major ways that this can happen. First is through the use of language. Second is through the use of dress. And third is through the use of rituals. So first, let's talk about language. So Camp, Camp Gladiator, the way every workout starts is with kind of a group cheer, or a, if you will, and the workout ends in the same way. And it's normally one of three things. It's either CG what what, better together, or CG strong. And so very quickly within, you, if you will, a week of workouts, you quickly would come to know the language around how we start a workout and how we end a workout. And so that was the same whether you're in person or whether you are in a video screen where the trainer is unmuting everyone, having them begin and end the workout in that way. The other thing is that they don't refer to their workouts as workouts. They're actually referred to camp. So you are going to camp when you go to a workout. And it's very specific language that they use as well. Uh, and even when it was virtual, they still continue to refer to workouts as camp. Are you going to camp today? What camp are you going to? Second, as it relates to dress, um, as you saw in the pic, might have seen in the picture that I showed before, let me go back very quickly. You can't really see it. Um, but the trainers, when it moved to a virtual workout, continued to have a lot of the same look of a workout or of camp virtually as you would in person. So in person, when you drive up, there's always the camp flag hanging. Every, there's a CG logo everywhere. People's mats have Camp Gladiator written on it. And so each trainer was challenged or was asked to create kind of their background to look like what a camper would expect to find when they showed up to camp in person. So that the look and the dress of a workout felt the same. The third, as it relates to milestones or as it relates to rituals, um, one of the things that CG often does is they celebrate milestones. So every 50 workouts or every 50 camps that you attend, you are celebrated. Um, and the more camps that you attend, the higher level within CG that you go. And it becomes a ritual and it's how people begin to refer to one another. So are you bold? Are you gold? Are you silver? What is your level within CG? And so quickly, you begin to acquire those different levels. And so virtually, anytime somebody was meeting a milestone of one of those levels, the workout began with a celebration of that milestone in the same way that when you're in in-person camp, the workout begins with the celebration of that milestone. So again, finding ways to continue to feel the, that sense of membership, that sense of I belong here in the virtual sense in the same way that they were doing kind of in the live in-person sense. The second aspect is influence, which is to say that a community member needs to feel as though they have an ability to impact or influence the community, but also that they need to feel the sense that the community is going to influence or impact them. And so some of the ways that CG was able to do this um, is when campers meet a milestone, the trainer will invite them to share their CG story, which is essentially to say, why did you join CG? Why do you continue to come to CG? How has it impacted you? And so a camper being able to share with the rest of the community what that experience has been, how CG has influenced them, but also the ability to influence other community members to motivate them, to keep them going, to remind them of why it is that they continue to show up. The second is the spotlight feature. So often during a workout, the trainer would introduce whatever exercise was going to be happening. But then once we got moving, they would spotlight an individual camper. They would spotlight somebody who had good form or somebody who was really pushing themselves that day. So really allowing that camper to feel like they were kind of leading the workout 
for that minute or two period that they were spotlighted. Again, being able to influence what was happening among the rest of the community. The third aspect is feel, feeling as though your needs are being fulfilled. So certainly, you know, the health and fitness needs of whoever is showing up to a workout are being filled, whether it's in person or virtually. Also, the sense of success that is being felt is the same, right? Certainly, maybe you're getting stronger, maybe you're getting faster, maybe you're losing weight is maintained, whether you're in person or virtually. But also, CG was able to continue the rewards that people feel as a result of that. And so each four-week cycle of workouts, CG as a company has been creating different challenges that then come with rewards. So trying to keep people motivated in a time when it's likely to not be motivated to work out by yourself in your driveway or in your living room through a computer screen, they created little challenges. So if in the next four weeks you get 12 camp check-ins, you'll receive this free t-shirt. Or if you come to 12 check in, if you come to 12 camps in the next four weeks, you'll receive points towards your account that you can use either towards your monthly membership or to spend in the CG store. So creating little rewards, little challenges along the way to help people feel that sense of reward, that sense of, sense of success, so that their needs are being fulfilled. And then fourth is the shared emotional connection, which is to say, how do you make, how do you help people feel connected to one another and in this sense, when they're not anywhere near one another, except through a computer screen. So some of the ways that they were able to do this, uh, some of my trainers that are pretty, usually pretty no nonsense, uh, not a whole lot of games happening at their camp, would turn their workouts into games. So there was one trainer who I remember one day uh, basically did a get a icebreaker like we in student affairs would do a thousand times over. Uh, but essentially it was a, have you ever and she would pose something out there and if you had ever done it you had to do so many of a certain exercise right so just a way for you to be able to watch through your computer screen and be able to get one and know get to know one another invest and learn about one another again from a distance another way that they were able to do that uh, is here in my local area they actually delivered yard signs uh, that they put in people's front yards just to let people know that you are a part of the CG community. So we know that you're in your houses and you're not seeing each other in person, but how can we put something physical at your home to kind of denote that you're a part of this community, to see who else is invested in this same community that you are. So those are the examples that I would share uh, from Camp Gladiator as it relates to this sense of community model. The next one, I'm gonna use the same examples, so the same, um, if you will, things that Camp Gladiator did, but I wanna talk about how it is that those things address the time and intensity model. So they did these things, they created a sense of community among campers by doing that, but how did they do it in a way that addressed all four of the quadrants? I don't know if they were doing that on purpose, I'm gonna guess no, uh, but I think part of what made it successful is that it did meet all four of those quadrants. So as we think about the minimal connection, uh, some of the things that are a minimal connection is that you, when you joined CG for the first time, you got a t-shirt, right? Or you got your car decal for your car. So you wore that t-shirt or you put that decal on your car. It didn't take a whole lot of time and there wasn't a whole lot of physical or psychological energy that went into doing that, but it made you feel like you were a member of that community by possessing that thing. So that would be in that minimal connection, low, small amount of time, low intensity. As we move into the somewhat connected, as we think about well, what took a little bit more time from a person, but still was pretty low in intensity. And I would say that that's learning the camp lingo, right? So it might have taken a little bit longer to do that. You might have even, it might have taken a couple weeks before you really got kind of the flow of how that works but still pretty low intensity, not really taking a whole lot of physical and psychological energy for you to begin using the lingo associated with attending a Camp Gladiator workout. As we move into the upper left quadrant, so beginning to feel connected to the community, so we're talking about a little bit higher in intensity, requiring a little bit more psychological or physical energy from a person, but still pretty short amount of time. The things that I would put there would be the opportunity for people to share their CG story, right? So it might only be 30 seconds that the trainer is putting me on spotlight and I'm sharing what my experience with Camp Lighter has been. 
but it's a little bit higher in intensity because I'm having to share more personally. I'm having to share more about myself. And it's also taken more energy for me to be able to get to that point, to be able to share that experience. And then lastly, in the very connected quadrant, so what's taking a longer amount of time and is higher in intensity, here's where I would put the celebrations of the milestones, the different levels that people are achieving. It's taking a while. So the first milestone is 50 check-ins. So that's 50 workouts that you're attending before you're receiving that milestone. And you're also putting in quite a bit of time uh, and physical energy into doing the workouts themselves in order to be able to achieve that milestone. And so I would put that in the very connected. And so you're feeling very connected because of the time that you've put in, but also the physical energy that you're putting into that experience. So again, that's just a look at, we can create these experiences, but needing to keep an eye on how connected are those experiences that we're creating actually going to make that person feel. So that's kind of a look at Camp Gladiator. What I wanna do now is I actually wanna turn the focus back to you. So I wanna say, okay, how do we take everything I just shared about what Camp Gladiator did, but how do we adjust it or make it work in a residence hall setting? And so the way that I'm going to do that, or the way I want to do that, is to talk to you about six of the challenge cards that we have created as a part of the basic model, and how it is that these challenge cards could be used to address both that sense of community, but also those different quadrants as it relates to time and intensity. So as I mentioned earlier, these challenge cards are intended to be done weekly or biweekly uh, by your RA staff and they each have a leadership challenge associated with them. So the first one is all about rituals and traditions. Certainly this is going to address the sense of belonging or the sense of community as it relates to membership. How are you making people feel as though they are a member of the community based on the rituals and traditions that you are creating and that they then know about? It's almost kind of this secret thing that your community does, that that floor of communities, that floor of that floor community does that maybe other communities don't do. So they're gonna feel that sense of membership. And what this challenge card is asking the RA to do or the leader of the community to do is to create a ritual or a tradition that that community can participate in. Certainly uh, when the community looks a little bit different, that might have been everybody going to the dining hall on Wednesday night for floor dinner together. Uh, but what I wanna spend more time talking about is kind of what could that look like in this world of COVID-19, where maybe only a handful of students are gonna be able to be together at a time, or maybe only roommates are gonna be able to be together at any single time. So as it relates to rituals and traditions, some ideas that I had, again, things that could create tradition among the community, build that sense of membership. So Netflix, uh, right, We've who hasn't done a community program where you've gotten together to watch a movie? But again, maybe it's not possible to all get together. Instead, maybe you're doing a watch party through Netflix, which if you didn't know, is a feature that Netflix has, is that you all can be watching the same movie together, but similar to Zoom, you can be seeing each other's faces off to the side. So you're in physically distant places, but everybody is still watching the same movie together. Maybe another idea is that you have a community Spotify playlist. So members of the community are able to add songs to the Spotify playlist that everyone in the community is able to listen to. And it's our special community Spotify playlist that we all get to contribute to. We all get to feel that sense of membership, but it belongs to our community. It's a tradition of our community. And maybe it's even played in the community. A third idea that I had um, was creating theme days, right? So some of your residents, because you're not gonna be able to get them all together probably for at least the fall semester uh, in any one room. Maybe it's creating kind of dress up theme days, if you will, that they, when they see each other on campus, would recognize one another. So maybe it's a color that they're wearing. Maybe it's a sports jersey that they're supposed to wear that day. Uh, whatever it might be, a theme day that your kind of leaders of the community would create, but a way for them to be able to spot and identify each other around campus. So those are some ideas around rituals and traditions. The next card I wanna to talk to you about is the balance card. And this card challenges, or the leadership challenge, is for the leader of the community to keep an eye on how are they balancing, how much energy they're giving toward a student's social success 
and how much energy they're giving toward a student's academic success. And so how are they balancing? Are they doing a good job of balancing their focus on both of those things? So one of the ideas that I had for that um, is instead of hosting tutoring or study sessions in your community, again, because maybe not a lot of students can be able to get, being able to get together, maybe it's a matter of creating a board within the community where students can be posting desired experiences as it relates to academics. So is it a course that they need assistance with? Is it that they need to give a speech but they want to practice giving it with somebody? What desired experience do they have academically or even socially? And then other members of the community could basically say, I can help you with that on the board. I have an asset that could help you with that. Or I'm just willing to help participate in that with you. Again, keeping an eye towards how are they balancing the academics with the social. And really what that is allowing members of the community to do is to fulfill one another's needs to feel as though I am contributing, my assets are going towards these experiences that others in the community want to have. The third card uh, that I wanna talk about is the humor card, which is to talk about the importance of humor in any community or in any group of people. Uh, certainly, I think campus is gonna look very different than any of us are used to. And so I think humor and having a sense of humor will probably be more important than it ever has been. Uh, to keep appropriate or to keep influencing some sense of levity among what may feel heavy at times during the semester. And so what this card challenges the leader of the community to do is to infuse humor in some way that week among their community. So some ways I thought about um, of how you might be able to or how a leader might be able to do that is they might invite residents in their community to submit jokes for a joke of the week that they post outside of their RA bedroom. Or they might have a door decoration competition to see who can create the most humorous meme that they put on their outside of their um, residence hall door. Or the third was hosting an open mic night, but certainly in a non-traditional sense in that it could either be through some sort of software like Zoom, or maybe it's a matter of everyone stays in their rooms, but we open our doors and whoever's turn it is on open mic is who's stepping into the hallway to speak loudly enough for everyone to hear, but we're all staying, the rest of us are all staying safely within our bedroom. So again, just thinking about what are things we've done in the past that have clearly been successful, but how do we tweak them, shift them slightly to make them work in this new situation? The next card is the expectations card. Um, and this is really an opportunity for residents to feel as though they are being able to influence the community that they are a part of. So what this card challenges the leadership, the leader of the community to do is to gather three different members of the community and ask them what their expectations were coming to live on campus and whether or not those expectations are being met. And so this is certainly still something that a leader of the community could do, whether it's sitting down one-on-one -on -one with students whether it's doing electronically, whether it's a Zoom conversation that they're having, whether it's a FaceTime call that they're having, whatever situation would work. But again, asking the residents of the community, what expectations did you have coming into this year? And have those expectations been met or have they not? And how can you be a part of helping meet those expectations or create a scenario in which those expectations are being met as a member of this community? The fifth card I wanna talk about is the relationship card. And so this again is driving at membership within the community. And so this card is really challenging the RA or the leader of the community to keep an eye towards the knowing names aspect of building community. And so this card really challenges them to in some physical way within their community space, create something that represents the community and involves the relationships that have been built and specifically involved using the resident's name. So how can you create something in the community that represents the community and involves the student's name? So a thought that I had is putting, whether it's a big piece of butcher board up on the wall or a bulletin board and inviting members of the community to create a mural of some sort that they individually can be contributing to. They don't all have to be doing it at the same time but they can be bringing themselves, the, their relationship to the community, to that mural, involving their name as a part of it, 
And then the collective of it is what would represent that larger sense of community. And the last one that I want to talk about today is the delegation card. So this card talks about um, how is it that your the leader of the community can take something that they are responsible for doing or a task that they need to complete for the sake of the community and how can they invite a community community member in to do it with them and or just totally delegate the task to them. And so this is thinking about the assets that are present in the community, what competencies are present in the community, how can a member of the community help fill a need that exists by involving them in doing it. So some things I've thought about with this, especially as we think about kind of the start of the academic year, is finding a member of the community who might help design a floor t-shirt that then we order and everyone gets to wear and gets to have as a part of the community, but how can I involve a resident in helping design that t-shirt instead of I as the RA being assuming that I'm the one that should design it? How can I involve a tech savvy member of the community in setting up a group me group for us all to be a part, a uh, group chat for us all to be a part of, again, so that we can keep lines of communication open. And then also the last idea I had is if you're hosting some sort of open mic night or if you're doing a bingo game in your community, again, either virtually or maybe with the doors open so everybody can hear, can you be in, can they be inviting a member of that community to host that evening? So instead of the RA being the host for the evening and facilitating it, can they be inviting a resident in? Can they delegate that role to a resident of the community who could be doing it instead? So that is a kind of a look at six of the challenge cards. So again, there are 46 in total. This is six of them. And how those leadership challenges that are being posed to the leaders of the community can be done in a way that is socially distant, but still keeping an eye toward how can they be developing a leader and how can they be developing as a leader as they develop their community? So with that being said, uh, I wanna go ahead and open it up to Q&A. And certainly if there is a question that comes in that either Dee or Claudia feel eager to answer, certainly they will know they can chime in to do that. Um, so the first question that I see is, do you have an example of a, of a board to request shared experiences, what tools would you advise for encouraging upper class students to engage? So I don't necessarily have a specific example to share. Uh, what I was kind of thinking about is even just something as simple as a piece of butcher block that gets hung on a wall or converting a bulletin board into this, this type of board. So essentially, where they are talking about shared experiences, way they, ways they can connect with one another. So you might just divide the piece of paper or the board in half. And on one side of it, students would be able to share the experience they wanna have or the thing they need help with or the course they wanna be tutored in. And then students would be able to come over and either put their name next to it or connect with that student in some way to help meet that shared experience or that need. Um, in terms of tools for encouraging upper class students, I think it's just, I will allow Dee and Claudia to chime in on this as well, but in my experience of working with upper class students, it, in, so I worked in an upper class hall for two or three years, and what I realized in that experience is that they do have needs, but in some regards, they feel like they should have it figured out by now. And so I think that's where most importantly, the six step model comes in, and really the role of the RA with an eye dedicated towards, are you getting to know your residents? because they're not gonna be as likely to come to you as a first year student is. And so really encouraging those resident assistants to be the proactive ones to go out and do that because their upper class students do have needs. They do have experiences they wanna have. They may not feel totally connected to campus, but they're not going to be as likely to come to the RA to express that. And so I think that's where the six step model is especially important in an upper class hall Again, because an upper class student is not going to come to the RA to share that if the RA is not doing the work to go out and seek out that information from the students themselves. Claudia or D, anything you want to add to that? The only thing I would add is that really the entire model was built a model was built upon upon the premise that we almost have an irresistible need to share what we're good at, right? I mean, if somebody asks you to contribute in a way or to doing something that you're naturally inclined or have talent and skill at, 
it's almost irresistible and it's almost impossible not to say yes. So the only thing I would add is in addition to mining for DEAs, if you will, experiences that they want to have or taking the initiative to do that, it's also just about really keeping an eye out for what are they good at? What, what, what do you notice about them? And then really deploying them in that way, actually specifically asking and making an invitation for them to do something for the community based on that talent. So something I was sitting here thinking about is in some ways when community isn't together physically, uh, then you almost have to a little go into overdrive helping people get to know one another. So I was sitting here thinking to myself that if there was a resident on the floor or the RA who was, you know, uh, inclined towards maybe a communication major or some such that they might start a podcast and really feature and interview each of the residents on the floor at some point and with a really interesting question that they maybe do, you know, through all through each of the residents. So there's, um, again, it's just really about making sure that we're giving airtime to, to each resident, upper class, first year student and figuring out ways to do that. So that's mm -hmm. it for me. I, I think the only thing I would wanna add to this is, um, I've actually been doing a lot of research lately about the idea of gamifying things. Um, I'm not sure that's come up in a lot of podcasts lately. Um, so I would, in, in regards to encouraging upperclassmen students, um, uh, you know, and I know Tyler, we can address your question down here as well, but this may go along with that. Um, you know, this idea of getting people involved with, um, adding incentives and rewards to it and how, and, and again, you know, how can you do that on, um, our lower budgets that we inevitably are, are going to have this fiscal year? Um, you know, so like trying to think outside of the box and be creative with how you can reward your students, you know, is there um, different swag that you might already have that you can be passing out? Um, is there something cool you can do within the cafeteria? Can you possibly work something out with, with the school um, to do different treats? Um, is there a way that you can provide something within your weekly programming where, you know, like Claudia is saying, you're highlighting these students who want to share these cool things that are going on in their lives. Um, think about that. Um, sometimes I know it can go back to, you know, when we were in um, like kindergarten and first grade when you, we all had like the gold stars next to our name. Um, but like, if you think about it, I think that motivates people and that helps them get towards a different goal. So um, I think that could apply, especially if you had something cool that you were able to offer to those upperclassmen students. I bet you'll see um, an uptick in their participation. I would add one thing to that. In this, Katie uh, shared earlier the intensity, the community connection model, the low intensity to the high intensity based on time and again, physical and psychological energy. I would almost suggest that something similar can work as it relates to rewards. So let me give an example. When I was working, I, I had left residence life, I was working in new student programs at SMU. And I was um, every summer, of course, very intense on your college campuses, the orientation leader experience, working long days and nights. Uh, and so I created one year based on something I had read about Walt Disney and how they motivate their employees at, at, at Disney. I created a concept whereby all summer long, so this is the long period of time element, all summer long, my uh, orientation leaders were earning beads. Now beads are like a penny, I mean, if that, right? And which is why I picked them, because they're inexpensive. So at the start of this summer, I created for each of them just a leather band. And every time that, that and I gave them basically to um, professional staff, all over campus. And I told them, if you see my orientation leaders on campus doing something above and beyond, giving great service, or just overall being an excellent orientation leader, you should feel free to give them a bead. And they were, there were different colors for different things. And then there were certain beads that I would only give. And maybe there was one a night for the overall, you know, outstanding performance or whatever it was of the day. I just, I don't remember the specifics right now, but, but this was a very low cost thing to do 
What gave it value was not the cost of the item because obviously, again, it was just a plastic bead. But what happened was because we did it over a long period of time, by the time that the end of the summer came, that necklace with beads became the most prized item that the orientation leader had over and above the sweatshirts and all the other cool stuff that we got for them but the, at the end of the experience. It was that beaded necklace that they cared the most about because it came kind of laden with value. Any other questions? I don't see any. We'll keep an eye on it. See, B, I'll keep an eye on it. See if any more roll in. Um, but with that, I just wanted to let you know that we do have one more uh, webinar in this series, and that is August 5th, same time slot as this one. Uh, and it will be led by B, and we will be looking at a third company or industry leading organization and how it is that they go about building community and how we can be adapting it to this time that we're currently living in. We do have one more question, Katie. Ooh, is there a particular order to the challenge card? So uh, there is not. So the way we created the model is that you would be able to draw them at random, actually so that the student staff themselves would be able to feel some investment in being the ones to help draw the card, whether it's together at a weekly staff meeting or if you're not able to have weekly staff meetings in person, maybe it's each week you designate, designate a staff member who gets to come to your office and draw one of the cards for that week that then gets shared out with everyone. Again, it can easily be adapted, but the way we created it is that it would be drawn randomly, and then the entire staff would complete that same challenge for that week. Some campuses, as they have began, begun to implement the model, have decided that that doesn't work for them. So they have gone ahead and they have divided up the cards into different, if you will, different quarters of the year to say, these six cards we really think should be done in the first six weeks of the academic year, things like rituals and traditions, the identity card, where the community is creating an identity with one another, so some of the cards that they thought really should happen towards the start of the year, some towards the middle, and some towards the end. So they, the way they were written, the way the model, the booklet is created, uh, is not that they would be done in a certain order, it's that they would be drawn randomly, but certainly campuses have uh, done it in a way in which they do them in a certain order. What we say is you know your campus better than you do, better than we do, and so certainly you're gonna know what will work best uh, for your students and your campus community. Well, I think that is it. We will hope to see you back on August 5th for session number three. I'll turn it back over to Spencer. Sure, and I am putting in the chat right now, again, that the link to number one in this series of creating close communities at a distance. Katie, Danielle, Claudia, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and to our audience members, thanks for spending some time with us. We give you back the gift of time. We'll end about five minutes before the hour. So thank you. We'll see you back here in about three weeks for episode three. Have a great day, everyone.